I, my passion is blending, combining wellness and psychology together. And I just want to give you a little, just talk a little bit about uh, what I do, some insight, and hopefully you'll, you'll find it interesting and maybe something useful from it, hopefully. So counseling is, you know, a pretty, you know, there's a lot that goes into it, let's just say. But for this, I like to simplify things as much as possible. So I try to, I've kind of distilled it down to two dimensions. You have the positive and the negative. So you might say the yin and the yang, if you like to take a Chinese perspective. Uh, so first, the negative, you know, that's kind of what we think of when we think of counseling. People come to counseling, why? Because they have problems. They have a lot of, uh, they have a lot of pain, they have suffering, they have, you know, we think of like negative feelings, negative emotions, a lot of problems, they, the challenges. And unfortunately, the counseling field has sort of focused a little too much on this. Sometimes we call this the disease model of care. It's been called that way. Other names for that, um, you might think of like emotional baggage. Sigmund Freud said, he called it neuroses. Carl Jung, he called it the shadow. So that negative, that whole negative side. Now, as counselors, we're sort of trained to deal with this stuff, and we, you know, it's a lot of it has to do with the past, learning how to let go of the past, like let go of the painful emotions, um, come to terms with things, resolve things, let go. So it, it's really important stuff. And as I said, we've been taught to deal with this stuff, and, and so we teach coping skills. Now, it's, um, it's a very important, like I said, important part of it. However, what I want to talk about, and what I want to present to you, is this whole, other, this whole other dimension. What I like to call, what it's called positive psychology. Some of you may have heard of it, some of you may not have. And, you, you know, it's just as important, if not more important, than the other side of it. And, and, and I think it, sometimes it gets forgotten. When we think of it, it's, it's, I like to think of it as like creating, creating well-being, creating good, good stuff in your life. All the, all the positive feelings, thoughts, behave, feelings, thoughts, and behaviors, good stuff that you put into your life, things like love, humor, joy, happiness, whatever, you know, things that stimulate you, make you enthusiastic for living, get, you know, give you something meaningful to look forward to, what you want to wake up and do, that positive stuff. That's really the stuff that I've always focused on more, and I really believe it's, an, it's, it's not considered enough. And Recently, we just started, it was since the 1980s, they just started this whole field called positive psychology. They did some research and they found that there was a 24 to 1 ratio of focus on all, like in the journal articles and stuff and, and research that there was 24 to 1 times more focus on what's wrong with people than what's right with people. Then a man came along named Howard Sullivan in the 80s and, he's, and he's, he, was, he was the uh, president of the American Psychological Association, so he was a prominent figure in the field. He said, he said, we're gonna change that. We're gonna focus, start to focus more on what's right about people. How do we help people become well? How do we find out how to make life more meaningful for people? And so he created this field called the uh, positive psychology. So like I said, it's really not anything new because I think ever since the beginning of time, we've studied positive stuff. You know, the Bible might have been the first positive psychology book. But as a field, as a scientific field, a credible scientific field, that was, that was when it started in the 80s. So I, I want to talk about one specific area of positive psychology that's important to me and that I've used a lot and, and I've used a lot in my own life and I've used a lot with uh, clients. And I'd like to call this the art of learning to be more present, to be more present in our lives. And that means sort of like being living in the moment, not in the past, not in the future, but being in the here and now. Sometimes you, you, you can call this mindfulness or being in, you could say being in flow, or sometimes people will say being in the, you're, you're in the zone. Um, there's, there's different shades of it. There's a, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff you can, different ways you can look at it. When you become so mindful in the present, when you're so much in the present, and you feel engaged in what you're doing, you can say, okay, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm in the zone, I feel the flow. You actually lose track of yourself. So therefore, so that's why it's one of the reasons why it's so healthy because you start to lose track of all the negative stuff that's hap that, that's going on. You you lose track of time, you lose track of, you, you, like I said, yourself, the world around you, and you become very focused. You know, it, like I said, there's different types because you could think of somebody like LeBron James, uh, the basketball player, you know, in the seventh game of the, the championships, he, you could say he, he feels, I'm really focused, I'm in the zone. And then on the, on the other side of the equation, you can have somebody who's reading a book and they feel, oh, I'm really, you know, 
in a good place. I, I kind of feel like I'm in that flow or I'm, I'm somebody who's fishing or something like that. You see there's a big difference, but yet there's similarities there. <coughs> I really feel, well, and it's also, it's also kind of mysterious too because you can't just like snap your fingers and say, all right, I'm going to get into, into the zone. I'm going to get into the flow because it just doesn't work that way. What you can do is you can create the conditions. You can sort of create the conditions that will make it more possible to happen. And one of the ways of doing that is matching the skill level with what you're doing with the difficulty level. If the skill level is too high and the difficulty level is too low, then you're, you're gonna, you'll experience boredom. If the skill level is low and the difficulty level is too high, you'll experience anxiety. So you try, whatever, no matter what it is, whether you, what you're doing, you try to find that, you know, that sweet spot there, and that will is give you a better chance of experiencing that feeling. That, that uh, experience of being you know, mindful, of being in the flow. <clears throat> and, and you know, we can practice things too. We can practice being mindful, mindful walking, mindful eating, you know, mindful breathing. There's a lot of different ways, meditating. There's different ways you can do this. Met sometimes we call it mental training. They call it mental training. I, I really think that one of the primary keys of happiness and well-being is finding activities that agree with you or that you know, can create this and give you a better chance of being in this flow state. So in other words, like I'll give you an example. Let's, let's say you hate your job. That's not a really good chance you're gonna experience flow in that job if you hate your job. So you might wanna think about finding another job. I'm not saying quit your job right away, but at least make a plan and say, all right, you know, next year or two years or six months, whatever it may be, I'm gonna get out of this. I'm gonna to move towards something that is, is a little bit healthier for me, my well-being. Um, you know, every, Michelangelo said, every block of stone has a statue inside of it, and it's the task of the sculptor to discover it. So we are each the sculptor of our own lives, and we all have a I believe we all have a masterpiece inside of us. But the only way that masterpiece will come out is if we can find things that we care about, find things that we're passionate about, that bring us meaning in our life, bring us joy, happiness, and possibly create flow. So when we work to find those things, you know, our emotional baggage, our neurotic side, all those uh, negative emotions, all the suffering, pain, emotional suffering, tends to take a back seat. I, I truly believe this. I've experienced it. I've seen it with other people. I know it's true. Not to say we do have to work on that stuff too. The great mythologist Joseph Campbell said, he said, follow your bliss. So I'm going to challenge you all tonight. Follow your bliss and find ways to create flow in your life. Thank you.